The Israel-Hamas war has brought about a plethora of questions and debates, including a discussion around freedom of speech. Nadine Strossen, along with her co-writer Pamela Peretsky, have published an article entitled Even Anti-Semites Deserve Free Speech. Nadine Strossen, who is Senior Fellow at FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, and the author of Free Speech, What Everyone Needs to Know, is here now to explain more. Nadine Strossen, welcome to the show. Can I ask you first and foremost about your article, uh, which is... Um, a, a, a rather provocative title, uh, the idea that even anti-Semites should be entitled to free speech. Can you explain your thinking there? Yes, and most importantly, it is not only my thinking, Andrew, but it is the unanimous thinking of the entire United States Supreme Court going back to the middle of the 20th century because defending freedom even for the thought that we hate to quote a famous Supreme Court justice, is less dangerous than giving government latitude to pick and choose which ideas are hateful and deserving of suppression. After all, this is a very subjective concept. Today in the United States, I'm sure the same is true in Britain as well, people tend to use the epithet of hate speech toward any idea that they disagree with or find hateful. So that epithet hate speech has been hurled at the phrase Black Lives Matter. That's been attacked as hate speech against police officers and against white people. The phrase Blue Lives Matter in support of, uh, of life of, of police officers has been attacked as hate speech against black people. Indeed, the phrase all lives matter has been attacked as insufficiently uh, respectful of the special challenges to equality for black people. Andrew, really sadly, because you're such a great free speech defender as well, and by the way, I really enjoyed your performance of your book about free speech on Audible, um, but I'm sure you will share my horror that on a number of college campuses in the United States, the phrase Free speech has been attacked as hate speech. So, um, you know, and another problem, I was listening to your fascinating discussion about pro-Hitler rhetoric in London, which I could not find more abhorrent as somebody who is the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, who could not be more critical of anti-Semitic speech. And yet, if people have those hateful anti-Semitic ideas, it really is important for us to know that, you know, hopefully they might be open to persuasion and education. Punishing somebody is not going to change their minds. But at the very least, law enforcement will be able to monitor them and make sure that they do not uh, actually engage in any violent or discriminatory conduct to carry out their hateful ideas. It's very interesting you mentioned that, Nadine, because there is obviously this situation that we're at war now. There's a war going on, obviously, between Israel and Hamas. People would say that in such conditions, you have to have limitations on speech because it might inflame issues. Do you accept that there are sometimes situations where you do need these restrictions? I, you know, somebody used the phrase free speech absolutists. I have never met one. The difference between those of us who strongly support free speech and others is that we, and I include the United States Supreme Court in that we, we insist that before government may restrict speech, there must be a compellingly important justification. It is often described by, as the emergency standard, that when speech directly directly and imminently causes or threatens certain specific serious harm. And there's no other way to prevent that harm short of punishing the speech than government may punish the speech. Uh, and that is not an impossible standard, but it is sensibly a difficult standard. So one, so earlier, one of your uh, commentators was talking about incitement. The US Supreme Court has said that even advocacy of violence or uh, lawless, lawless conduct is protected. The only thing that is not protected is intentional incitement of imminent violence that is likely to happen imminently. Um, so if somebody is more loosely using rhetoric that might at some future point 
potentially lead to violence, that simply gives the government too much latitude and discretion. And what it inevitably does is use that discretion to punish dissenting voices, voices that are critical of government policies. In the United States, before the Supreme Court adopted that emergency standard, Andrew, the voices that were repressed included all advocates of equal rights, including civil rights. That speech was seen as, as dangerous and as threatening to the status quo and insulting to the dignity of people who were uh, supporting Jim Crow and racial segregation. So the point is, if you want to have freedom for the thought that you love, then you have to tolerate freedom for the thought that you hate. And by the way, the most effective way to counter that hateful idea is through hearing it, refuting it, ignoring it, persuading against it, lobbying against it, making sure it is not translated into actual hateful, discriminatory violence or other conduct. That's very interesting to hear you say that, Nadine. I think people forget that a lot, that when you clamp down on free speech, you're setting a precedent, a legal precedent, to enable the government to censor whatever speech it likes in the future. I think that's such an important point. But what about uh, some of the, the, the critics of the marches we've had in London recently? Uh, what, what they have said is, what about the safety of Jewish people in London at the moment, many of whom feel they can't even walk down the streets of their own uh, native city? What, what do you make of that? I certainly support uh, government providing safety uh, and protection against actual physical assaults, as well as, remember, Andrew, I said, not all speech is protected. Another category of speech that satisfies this emergency standard, in addition to intentional incitement of imminent violence, is threatening speech. When the speaker intends to instill a reasonable fear on the part of particular targeted audience members that they will be subject to violence, even if the speaker doesn't intend to carry out the violence, the mere fact that you reasonably fear violence means not only is your own free speech violated because you then don't dare speak up, but even your freedom of movement. As you say, if you're afraid to go out uh, because you're afraid that you're going to be subject to an assault, that government has a responsibility to protect you against that kind of reasonable fear. And appropriately, here in the United States, just a week or so ago, we had a student on a college campus, a university campus, Cornell, arrested and subject to federal criminal prosecution because of threats that he put out on the internet that were specifically targeting the Jewish community at Cornell. That was appropriately seen as a punishable true threat subjecting him to arrest. But when we're talking about hateful rhetoric that simply makes you, you know, abhor the idea but not feel that you are going to be subject to an immediate physical attack, uh, it is not appropriate to punish that speaker. And I would also argue, Andrew, it's not an effective way to counter the actual attitude. You know, there are many, many case studies of people who formerly supported hateful ideologies who have repudiated those beliefs and who are now devoting their lives to trying to stop other people from going in that direction. In the United States, we have a whole organization called Life After Hate. And all of these people say that what worked was when people, not punishing them, not even shunning and shaming, shaming and canceling them, but reaching out to them to try to get them to criticize and question and revisit their own views, uh, to get to know people in the groups that they believe that they hate, to break down those prejudices and stereotypes. You know, that kind of educational approach is not guaranteed to work in every situation, but history shows that punitive censorship is guaranteed to fail. Well, Nadine Strassen, thank you ever so much for joining me tonight. Really appreciate it. And Nadine's book, uh, which is called Free Speech, What Everyone Needs to Know, is out now. I would thoroughly recommend it. Do check that out.
I'd like to bring in uh, Bruce and Francis now to get their thoughts on this. Uh, Francis, it's very interesting hearing Nadine. Nadine was mm. president of the ACLU in the 90s and early 2000s, and the ACLU very famously defended the right of neo-Nazis mm -hmm. to march in Skokie in Chicago in the late 70s. And uh, a man called Arya Naya wrote a book about that, who was the president of the ACLU at the time, called Defending My Enemy. You know, he's a Jewish man mm -hmm. saying it, it, the reason why he wants them to have the right to march is so they can expose those horrendous views. Nadine made that point that actually hearing that man on the street praising Hitler, well, at least we know that these views are being held. At least we can do something about it. Mm. Do you agree with that? Yeah, look, I completely agree with that. And it's always nice to see Jeremy Corbyn interviewed. You know what I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Francis <laughs> Foster, he's not here to defend himself. himself. Right. But no, but I, I really do believe that because it's re it is vitally important that when there is this undercurrent of hatred that it gets the daylight that it so clearly needs. Because if we just force it more and more underground, it will be festering there and you will give these people a legitimacy and a glamour they simply don't deserve. So that's the point, isn't it, Bruce? I mean, what do you make of this? Like, the, it is horrible hearing these people praising Hitler, saying openly anti-Semitic things. But is Nadine right that actually the fact that we know that they're there is, is kind of helpful. I think the, the most interesting thing that she said to me was she doesn't know a free speech absolutist in its entirety. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, you get these people that preach being puritanical mm -hmm. and they're not at all. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and I know that people have views on this channel and us participating and all that kind of stuff. They don't watch it. There's no discussion. It's just that's bad. And you're like, right, you can't just come from there. Yeah. You know, it's a bit like the SNP screaming about the Tories. All yeah, the you've got to hear. To more. You've got to hear every you side. You catch more flies with honey. Well, he always has a lovely, beautiful phrase to end on.